like to call the meeting to order verify compliance with open means law notification and adopt the agenda if you can all please stand for the pledge to the flag i pledge allegiance to the flag of the united states of america Okay, so up first will be staff and student spotlights and recognitions. The staff spotlight will be the Character Academy. At Whitnall High School. Yeah. Uh, so today we want to talk about how we are using restorative practice at practices at Whitnall to form relationships and improve our culture and climate. So uh, traditional methods of behavior management, such as detentions, lunch detentions, uh, have not proven to be effective, both at Whitnall and just historically, um, mainly because students are not forming relationships with teachers and it just results in repeat behavior. And so what uh, I was able to go to, uh, thanks to actually the board approving it and leasing approving it, was leaving the village. This was by Kevin Oliver this fall, uh, both <coughs> by and relative to myself, and I think uh, Jackie or Amy or someone was there for a day as well. Um, so essentially, one of the things that we really, really learned, besides for the building relationship piece, was how do students learn? Basically, it's not just about, just, it's not about punishment. It's about teaching you guys, teaching you guys lessons, and how, what's the best way to do that? So that really got us thinking about what, what is the best way for us to do that at the high school, rather than just handing out detention, just like you guys know, you probably don't learn much from detention, you might feel bad about it, right? but you don't, feel, you don't learn a lot from it. So how can we learn, right? which would be the next slide. So some of the things we're piloting, um, there's some things that we've already done. So some of those things that we've already done are like restorative circles, which is a big buzzword right now. Also just teachers getting to know their students better with my story, which is something we're doing district-wide. Um, but some of the things we're, we're piloting this year that have had some, some success so far, the first is reflection presentation. So this could be something as small as a kid swearing on a bus or something as large as like a pushing or, and shoving match in the hallway, where traditionally you give a detention for that, uh, give a suspension for that, which really, what, what are you learning from that? The point is to learn from the, the wrong deed. And so what the reflection presentation is, is first the kid comes in and we talk about the situation and we kind of talk about, hey, this is, what, this is what's going on. Um, so the first part is just getting to know them. We want to know what they like, what their hobbies, hobbies are. The point of that is just to get to know them a little bit better. The second part is they reflect on what they did, um, why they did it, how it affected the school culture, and how to correct this wrong and how to prevent it from happening. So, so far we've done this. Like I said, as a pilot, we've just started doing this. We've done it with 12 students. Um, we've had 83% success rate, so no repeats with that and we recovered eight days of out of school or in school suspensions. So that's something we're planning on using a lot more of because what we're seeing is that students are not repeating um, their infractions and they're actually learning lessons from what they did. Um, a similar piece that we have been using, uh, slightly different than the reflection presentation, is our Character Academy, where students really work to reflect on who they are as people, what values are really important to them, and if their actions are <coughs> reflecting those values or not. Uh, so, for example, we had a student who was exhibiting repeated theft. Approximately every six months since 2016, the student had stolen something from school. Every time it was responded within one day of out-of-school suspension, uh, this student participated in our Character Academy where they went through a series of reflective projects to really think about who they are as a person. And as of yet, we have not had seen a repeat behavior. So that's been a, su a success. And so last slide, where do you want to kind of go with this? So basically, uh, we want to refine our practices. So for example, we just recently, you know, we talked about the theft. We recently have someone that uh, had a cell phone three violation and handed us a burner phone and got away with it for like two, uh, quite a while until someone else caught it. So we're trying to refine it to different areas besides. So we've done one for theft. Now we're doing one this week for honesty. So we're trying to figure out what are all the different avenues that we can get things set up for. So that's kind of more of a, okay, here we go, this is now three days that we're gonna do this together after school, where you're gonna spend some time with us and you're gonna work on um, you know, what are the main um, things that you think about when you think about honesty, who are some role models that you could think, like whether it's Abraham Lincoln or whatever athlete. Um, and then to uh, eventually 
expand this to uh, incoming ninth grade students as to actually like an academy where I would work with uh, Mr. Relich, the middle school principal over the summer, and say who are some good kids that we could talk about getting into this like academy, possibly as like an eighth hour type thing or an after school thing where um, we could really work with them and maybe bring in some cool community people in to talk with them as well. Yeah. Um, also teacher connections, we really want to loss at school, and I know I'm going over my, my time here, but plan B from loss at school, something that we really want to push with our faculty. Um, I'd be happy to talk with any of the board members and the community members about how important I think this is for really teachers to get to know the students and be able to problem solve with students when they see behaviors in class because it's not that the students are being bad kids, it's that they're doing things because they have a learned behavior or something that really they need to work with. So, or Russ, teachers what need to is work lost with them. in school? What's that? What is lost in so school? So lost in school, that's, you see the book up there, um, it's by Dr. Ross Green, and it's just a really good book that gets into um, different kind of case studies about um, how to work through problem behaviors for teachers in classroom. It, gi it gives teachers some really great language to be used, and um, it gives teachers kind of a, a formula for behavior response of, tell me more about that, or a lot of sentence stems that really kind of get at the root of why the child is performing the behavior, and really helps to be more preventative versus reactive. Yep. And so there's, there's this straight up plan B, which is really preventative, where you spend a lot of time to do it. They also have like a proactive one, which is in the moment in a class to kind of keep the class moving and, and uh, figure out how to help that student um, in the moment. So. Based on more problem solving versus strictly punitive, which is what we're trying to do at Window, at the high school. Yeah. Do you do these things after, after hours? Great question. Um, it's a case-by-case -case basis. Um, it kind of depends on the student, what we're, why they're in Character Academy, um, their, their story. Are they able to stay after school? Do they have the transportation means where they can stay after school? Um, we always try to work with families yeah, instead so, of against them. So, for them. example, so someone that takes the bus home right after school, parents can't pick them up. What can't walk is, home. Yeah, can't walk home. We've done, all right, you're going to come hang out with us and eat lunch with us and work on this for the next couple of days. Um, so it's kind of about meeting the student where they're at and really trying to get that growth from meeting them where they're at and showing that, showing that we care. Yeah. So, uh, so I'm trying to understand, uh, expand to catch incoming ninth grade students and program for, I think, ninth grade students identified for middle school. What does that mean? So, so I, I think what your question is, is having all this with ninth, grade, ninth graders Okay, but when you say like uh, identified from middle school, is that what you said when you talk? You mentioned talking to Ryan Relic over the summer. So, so I think one of the so I came, I came from a place that wasn't a district; it was just a high school. All right. So I think one of the really great benefits that Whitnall has compared to where I came from is that um, you're you're a district, which means that you can I can communicate with Ryan and see what's coming, you know, down the pipeline in terms of hey, what are some things that you know I can help kids with that are coming up here next. Um, and he might be able to say, hey, these are some kids that could really use this program. Now, that's what we have to find a little bit more is what would this program even look like. Um, but just being able to say, you know, these are some people that could use, whether it's, a, whether it's getting some more peer mentors and, and strong role models for them to work with. Um, I think there's a lot of different avenues that it could go. It's just more of sitting down and talking about how it could work. The concern I would have is in having a, a list of, of um, for lack of a better term problem kids you're sending over to the high school from the middle school. I mean, when kids get labeled, it's not necessarily the best thing. So mm -hmm. I'm kind of, when I saw those two lines, I got a little concerned about what are we actually talking about doing here? And the, the way I would look at that is it's not a label, it's support. So just like, you know, we know a kid's coming up, they might need some mass support, same thing here. Um, but yeah, I, I'm the same with you. I'm anti-tracking and everything else. Yep. So okay. I, I, I try and stay away from labels. I, I, I look at what, is, what supports can we give. But regardless of what you call it, that effectively could be what it is, and that concerns me. Yeah, especially when high school can be considered a fresh start for a kid. Exactly. So um, you just, it's something that you can give some thought to. Can you back up a slide, please? So in that example, uh, <coughs> right now we're four months out, is that right? I uh, can you, I'm sorry, what is so your question? So in that example, we haven't had a problem since uh, September? Yes, so that's correct. So we're four months out at this point, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks.
Thank you for your time. Thank you. Okay, next is a student spotlight with Destination Imagination. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Act board meeting usually looks with this many people. Um, so this was uh, Edgerton student spotlight, and um, uh, and so I asked Ben to come and talk about um, Destination Imagination and um, one of the projects that's coming up, a wellness night at Edgerton. And he said, Chris, I can't bring up um, just Edgerton's team. Uh, could we have see the uh, L uh, Hales Corners team and the middle school team as well? Because this is happening in three different buildings and the other principals were like, let's go for it. Uh, so we've got the whole crew uh, here right now. And I'm gonna turn it over to Ben to talk a little bit about Destination Imagination, which is new to Edgerton, I mean, new to Edgerton this year and to the other buildings. And then uh, the kids are gonna get a chance to talk. Thank you. Um, so uh, as Chris mentioned, Destination Imagination is a new extracurricular opportunity that we have this year um, at both elementary schools as well as the middle school. Um, it is uh, a national organization um, and the intent is to target um, students who need an outlet for creativity, leadership, and fine arts. Um, we opened that up with the intent of having one team at each of those three buildings this year and had such a strong response that we ended up with two teams at HCE and two teams at the middle school um, and one completely packed team at Edgerton. So we now have five teams with a total of 28 students um, and three coaches. So I coach the team at Edgerton. Um, Monica Heckenberger coaches the team at HCE and Katie Sider coaches the team at Whitnell Middle School. So um, we invited some of our students to come and share um, what this club has meant to them and what we're doing this year. So I will apologize ahead of time. We will definitely go over three minutes, but I promise not everyone's talking. So, <laughs> so it's gonna be okay. All right, so first up we have Whitnell Middle School. All right, as he said, I'm Katie Sider. I teach band across the street. And uh, my team, this is some of, part of two teams that I have. Um, we have a sixth grade team and a seventh grade team coincidentally this year. And I have Rylan, Emma, and Colin. Okay. Uh, hi, my name is Rylan Baki and I'm a part of the sixth grade team at Destination Imagination at WMS. Um, <laughs> this doesn't work so you can be heard. Uh, okay. And destination imagination to anyone who enjoys theater, arts, and work. <clears throat> Hello, my name is Emma, and um, our group chose improv. And so here's like the um, elements. So first is conundrum, and like such as example as prize winning um, duck is missing. And then um, a villain's superpower um, is like X ray vision, and then a hero um, um, overwhelming power is like, I mean underwear power is color changing nails. And then we get like a sound effects box. So um, like for our skip that we're doing is so we're gonna do wood cause we were knocking on the door. And so we're gonna put the wood in the so it's gonna knock on the wood. So it kind of gives like a sound there. And then like a little bit about our skip. And so I'm the villain and then, um, so there's a house that's being sold. So like I get the house. And then um, there's something like like in the ho under um, in the ground that I want, so that I guess like get money or something that will be like announced like when we do it. And then um, I cannot like the person because they have the key that I want to you know get the things that is underground. Thank you. Next up, we have our teams from HCE. I'm Monica Hackenberger. I teach general music at Hales Corners Elementary. Um, the elementary schools have chosen an entirely student-driven project based in community service. Um, so I have a few of our fourth and fifth grade team members here tonight. Um, we have Maddie, Mila, um, <laughs> Anna, Lily, and uh, this is also Anna. Um, and a few of them would like to say a little something to, for you. Hi, this is Mila, 
and Anna from the fifth grade destination imagination team at HCE for the fifth grade destination imagination team we are hosting a coat drive we chose this for the community because all the people who don't have coats can stay warm this winter hi my name is Lily Sitzberg I am part of the fourth grade team for our community service project we chose to do a mac and cheese drive. Our goal is to help the hungry. After all, everyone needs food to survive. We are going to donate to local charities. We chose mac and cheese because it is easy to make and it doesn't spoil. I am enjoying Destination Imagination and being part of a team. Thank you. And then last but not least, we have our team from Edgerton. And we have a few students coming up to speak. Um, I have the privilege of coaching the Edgerton team, and my name is Ben Williams. I'm the Dean of Students at Edgerton and Hales Corners, as well as the Gifted and Talented Coordinator. So first up, we have Quinn, who will tell you a little bit about why we chose this service project. Our team thought that the holiday stress was too much, and we created Wellness Night. There, we decided people could unwind together and have fun. Hey, second through fifth graders. Come on down to ES for Wellness Night, 6 to 8 p.m. on January 30th. Fun activities. Crochet. Fitness. Games. Reading. Healthy snacks. Don't, Don't miss, miss out, out on, on Wellness, wellness night. night. Okay, so we have a regional tournament Saturday, March 15th at the at the Muskego High School. Come on down to support your Wetno Falcons. Ka <laughs> So thank you so much for inviting us to be here tonight. Thank you very much for all the parents making sure their kids could make it. And we appreciate your support. If anyone's able to make it to Muskego High School on Saturday, March 14th, it really is a good time to come and watch. Great job. Awesome. Great job. So we're just going to give you guys an update tonight. That's a hard yeah, one to follow. Hold on one second. <laughs> to the quiet guys now. School Student Council Report. Yep. Alrighty, well my name is Emma Peterson. As you all know, I'm the Student Council President over at Whitnell High School. And I'm Anaya Beer. I'm the Vice President. So just an update on our Poppins events. Um, we have visited one of the home girls basketball games, I believe it was, and it went pretty well. We had a good amount of Student Council people go. Um, we're going to the musical this week on January 16th, and then we also have a list of some future events that we may possibly go to. So once again, these are like under-attended events in our school that we want to be able to support our peers with. And I encourage you all to go uh, to the musical. I'm in it. Um, it's going to be Thursday through Sunday, and tickets are $10, and it's really a good show. So. Great. Sure. <laughs> I would agree. We got just got promote. invited by them in the last half hour to go and watch <laughs> Act Two, so yeah. they did a really good job. <laughs> Thank I would you. Agree. <laughs> Alrighty, and coming up next um, in February, we have our Glow Coming coming up. Um, we started advertisements. We did. Um, we sent out an email as well as we made a poster, and we're gonna start putting stuff out for that. Um, we established when we're doing ticket sales, so we're just getting the ball rolling with that. And then on the next slide, we have 
kind of what our poster is going to look like and our theme. So our theme is Astral World. I don't know if you all know um, the rapper Travis Scott. He came out with a um, album Astral World, and I just think putting that kind of name on it, um, it's going to you know draw in more people because people kind of know you know kids know all about that. Um, we just want to do what we can since this is our first year having something like this. We just really want to have like a positive name on this. So we thought that adding a theme would kind of amp it up a little bit for the students. Mm -hmm. And then our Gives Back Week is approaching pretty quickly. It's in March, but that's going to come quick. So um, we divided our student council into different committees to um, help out with certain events in our Gives Back Week. So we have our hair donation, our Mr. Falcon, which is like the beauty pageant for guys. Um, we're kind of deciding what we're going to be donating. I think we were talking about uh, the homeless population in Milwaukee because of um, the, I think it's the Democratic something coming to town and it's like pushing people kind of out of town. So we were thinking somehow we're going to try to help them. We're still doing research on it, but... So we're just getting things rolling with that as mm -hmm. well. So yeah, yeah, we'll have more stuff on that the next time we're here. Great. That's Sorry, all. what was the polar plunge? You didn't touch on that. I saw that on there. Did oh, you actually yeah. go um, and do it? That's that's a DECA event. Okay. So DECA members are, you know, um, welcome to do the polar plunge. I usually at the zoo, right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I just saw that and that sparked my interest. But. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> didn't the swim team do a they usually go on Lake Michigan. Lake Michigan, yeah. The, the New Year's oh, Day. yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that could be like a fundraising yeah. thing. Yeah. That could be a, a contest. Oh, maybe. Maybe. It could be. <laughs> if it's a fundraiser, we're all yeah. Yeah, There we go. <laughs> Anybody else? Well, I had talked to, your, to Jesse, your advisor, and... So we have an election coming, a uh, school board election coming in April. And um, last year we started uh, having the, uh, you guys uh, moderate it. Mm -hmm. And we'll have to get together and, um, it, uh, and get a date and then work on the, uh, on the format with you. Sounds good. If you guys are interested. Yeah, yeah. I'd be happy to help with Yeah, me too. Awesome. Sounds Great. good. Awesome. All right. Thank, All right, well, you. thank you. Thanks. Have a good night. You too. Should we turn it off? Okay, on to five discussion and future action items. Uh, a open enrollment, Mike. Yeah. Um, so just a, a couple things on the printout itself and the board packet. Uh, one is uh, the, the high school portion got cut off there in the board packet. There are five openings at the junior uh, level. Um, just so you're aware, zero uh, for ninth, tenth, and twelfth grade, but five at the uh, high school level. On the second sheet on the projection sheets, uh, this is, there's been a correction. The optimal capacity at the high school is 203, causing that junior number to be five. Okay, so to match, match the top. So this is the third year we've done this uh, in this particular way. Again, it's just using a survival rate, we call it, all, all the kids surviving. Okay? Just the survival rate, meaning how many kids from one class so in the next year, um, the biggest classes go up and down. We take a seven-year average of that and try to get some projections going. Um, and so uh, really what we're, we're looking at is there are 31 tuition waiver students. Those numbers, those students uh, per board policy are given uh, open enrollment preference. And thus, they're kind of taken out of the projection and then kind of recast the open enrollment openings that you see. So. There are 92 total openings, uh, a little bit misleading as, for example, our HCE has 17, um, and you can look at kind of the historical of where that's coming. Last year it had 12 openings, and there just doesn't seem to be um, many fifth grade, uh, or excuse me, current fourth grade HCE students going to fifth, um, the fifth grade. So that's a large portion of it that just has not been filled historically. So we don't expect, for example, there to be that many fifth grade students. We also have then 
30 at the middle school, and most of that comes from that st optimal <coughs> student count being bumped from 190 to 200 uh, due to having some additional hires at the sixth and seventh grade. So uh, we're kind of taking that into consideration. Um, all in all, this is predominantly to keep, try to keep that number around, um, you know, traditionally we're around 2450 to 2500. That 2500 gives some more options as far as kids signing up for classes as new classes, or as you, as you look at board policy and trying to get enough kids, maybe 12 to 18 students to be able to run a class. We want to have numbers that are robust enough to be able to support uh, those additional or any sort of classes that we want to be out there, especially the elective. So um, with that, I, I suppose I could take any questions. Chris, can you send, uh, can you send us the um, sheet without the numbers cut off at some point? Yeah, yeah yes, that. yes, yes. Uh, s secondly, you know, there's the concern, well, the, the statistics or I guess studies or whatever show that it's best to bring students into your system or your district at, at a lower age and yet because of the numbers we've got significant numbers coming in uh, at fifth grade seventh grade or, and or from I guess into sixth grade and mm -hmm. you can see them there the listed is mm -hmm. fifth and seventh um, is there any concern about um, issues from that or cultural issues or problems down the road or anything with such high numbers and in, in focused grades I can, I can let other people speak to the to the cultural piece of that, but um, of the of the 31 openings, just so we're aware, um, 12 of those are going to mo more than likely be filled with tuition waiver students. So now we're bringing that. Who are already here? Yeah, right? who are already okay. here. All right. Um, so 12 of those those 31. So we're bringing that number down to 19, um, spread out over the three grades. You know. Um, the bigger number being at the at the seventh grade predominantly. Um, is that entering seventh grade or currently? That's going to be entering seventh okay. grade. All yeah. right, thanks. Yeah, entering seventh grade. So you're bringing in some would be sixth graders who are, uh, are at the seventh grade. Again, it's been a pretty what we expected to have happen from the fifth grade into sixth grade. We expected there to be 196 students with last year's calculation. And that just didn't pan out. There's only 184. So that's why that number going into seventh grade is much bigger, too. Um, but I don't know, if, Bob, if you want to speak about middle school at all. But that's what I would add to the conversation. <coughs> 12 of the 31 is tuition waiver kids who are already here. John had asked, what does it mean to bring students in at the middle school level? I said to keep in mind that of the 31 openings, 12 are tuition waiver students, meaning they're already in the buildings and more than likely would be um, coming back. The and the transition piece yeah. to have students come from um, outside of Whitnall at the middle school level. I mean, can I just take that microphone back there so oh, I can come up. the answer gets on? <laughs> I guess uh, my it, at, regardless of where your transition points are at, there's going to be kids coming in and coming and going depending on schools. So for us, sixth grade is one of our transitions. So you know we do probably get a fair number of kids coming from private schools moving in at that point. Um, in a different spot for me, we had that transition point at fifth grade and or eighth grade. At so those were transition points for us. It's it, it can be, it's like any kid. I don't, I don't notice that there's a transition issue with kids coming in from outside versus kids that You know, I mean, we, we, our kids have been a part of those two. So I don't know if I'm answering your question entirely or not. It but helps some. Okay. Um, I had one more question for the middle school thing. Mm -hmm. um, what was the... Uh, can you remind me of the nature of the increased staffing at the middle school? And I'll get, I'll, I'll get to the, the, the reasoning behind the question is if, if part of the reason for the increased staffing was um, because of student load at the middle school, and now we're talking about upping the load mm -hmm. to meet the increased staffing, mm -hmm. you know, it, it wouldn't make much sense to me. Yeah, so when we increase from 190 to 200, when we bring an additional staff member on, um, you're talking about traditionally a section that's going to have 25 to 27 kids, somewhere in that range. 
So when you bring on an additional staff member, uh, when you spread that out, yes, there was a reduction in, in the class size, but we're not raising the optimal capacity by 25 full students. We're, we raise it by 10 per grade level. So while an additional teacher reduces some of that, um, um, some of that optimal capacity, they didn't take on a full new 25 students, so we raise it 10. And we have the space there as well at the middle school to handle that also. Does that, go ahead. What I would say is that um, our own resident count for the current sophomores was very high. So we saw a couple years I, that were higher, and so we saw that grow. And so as we try to, you know, we try to mitigate any ups and downs the, the best we can. So that increase in staffing was a reaction to our own resident count through a couple grades through that the middle school. Through. Correct, okay. that had passed through. And right. so now that we found ourselves, and all of a sudden, as, as we had said, we're down so many students in the next grade, we're trying to fill that, yep. looking what's happening in like the current fifth grade class, right? So we're trying to mitigate that at certain grades so we can keep staffing at a level that's able to serve our own students yet, you know, live uh, through those, yeah. Uh, uh, several years ago, we had a, uh, a class go through that had significantly fewer students at HCE, and I know one thing they did was, um, uh, Lori did was uh, move a, a, a teacher from one grade level to another grade level to accommodate that that decline in that particular thing. And I assume we're doing the same thing here with the middle school is adjusting uh, teachers uh, around to uh, uh, accommodate where the large population is and the small one. Okay. Yeah. yeah we had a, remember we had that class reduction mm -hmm. teacher at Edgerton because we had that very large fifth grade class. Cr Chris, right now from last year we added a class mm -hmm. reduction. I mean, if you look at the numbers that are currently in fifth grade, both HCE and Edgerton are very close, which typically Edgerton is a three-section school. And in that class for last year and this year has been a four-section school just because, and we only have one open enrollment student in that whole population at Edgerton. So that, that was clearly a resident count. And that's a temporary um, hire at that level because then it, it tapers off again. Okay, thanks. Yep. So what is the projected count for the that fifth grade class along with HCE going into the middle it's school. 197. 197 right there. So that's projected to be 197, but there's five tuition waiver students. We can pull that number out and add and we'll bring them to be a 200. With a large availability at the seventh grade. Is that something we expect to fill? Is there a demand for that? Or is that something that we think will probably fill once they hit high school? Um, well, I'd say high school, we traditionally, it, the, the numbers bear out that we traditionally are not adding a lot. In ninth grade school. we do, ninth grade. Not this year. But so. that, that class, I could see it. I would agree that filling at seventh grade is a hard transition. Most families do not typically put in for open enrollment at seventh grade because it's in the middle of a, a sequence of grades. If they were going to, if that gap still existed when that seventh grade class becomes freshman, that, that is a transition point. We could see it. It's more likely to be filled when they become freshmen than it is when they are seventh graders. But again, no guarantees, and who knows what happens with resident count either. We'll continue to monitor it. But it is more likely the odds are that families would choose to switch at a ninth grade than they would at a seventh grade. If they didn't switch at sixth grade, the likelihood of them deciding to switch at seventh grade is probably not great. Anybody else? Uh, I should make a note that we're doing the January count right now, and that January count traditionally we get more students from our September, from our third Friday September count. And so you could see some of these numbers, the current numbers increase, causing the projection, the open enrollment to go down. Um, so 92 right now is probably high, but when we come back on the second meeting, that the number will probably be lower, just so you're aware. All right, thank you. On to six reports and discussion. A is the Whitnell High School bell schedule. Uh, <clears throat> so this is actually maybe the third time you have seen this. Um, so kind of walking through our process. Um, so we've had some conversations here at the board level, um, had 
a scheduling subcommittee of teachers and students uh, that we've kind of looked through some different scheduling options, um, discussing hypotheticals of what things would look like uh, if we move to a different type of bell schedule uh, to take advantage of the new remodeled spaces uh, of our cafeteria and um, the former special services space. Um, through those conversations, we have concluded um, a modification to our current bell schedule, so maintain the seven period day. Uh, however, we would add uh, essentially a, a resource period in the middle of the day uh, tied to the lunch period. Um, we would still need to, as a committee, work together on some of the parameters around that, um, but really the, the goal is really to focus on uh, identifying time for teachers to collaborate, identify time for uh, students to have that bit of downtime and relaxation, um, maybe a recess, if you will, uh, for those students that need that active break. Um, really have that still tied as student time <clears throat> and then uh, still keep uh, Falcon time at the end of the day as our, our main focus for uh, academic instruction and uh, intervention. With this to maintain a uh, uh, 46 minute class period, we would start the day five minutes earlier. Um, this would actually alleviate some of the, the busing concerns we also have. Mm -hmm. Um, so we would start at 7.40 instead of 7.45 for students. Uh, teacher's schedule would not be affected. They would still maintain their 7 to 3 schedule. You're adding a minute on the end too, huh? Not yet. Yes. Yes. Sorry. As well. Thank you. <coughs> Catch up as well. Are you looking pretty set with the 9th and 10th and 11th and 12th being separated? And I guess how do you address the, if we do go that way, some of those mixed classes of a 10th and 11th? Yeah, so I mean, during that block of time, if, if you're in 5A lunch and resource, um, we can divvy up how we want to do that however. Mm -hmm. um, today we, we spent some time with Infinite Campus around this new scanning software to take attendance. Um, so it, that's just a, a quick and easy way to divvy them up uh, by grade level. Yeah. It's not a hard and fast. Um, uh, yeah, as okay. a committee, we'd still want to investigate some of those procedural things of how do we manage who's where yeah. so we don't have you know uh you know mr stakoviak coming for two lunch periods <laughs> and i think the big reason i brought it up because i remember hearing from the students and they said how it'd be nice to have more of a all classes yeah. mixed together just because especially some of the younger students getting a little yep. more unruly and it kind of checks them a little bit so yep if that's just for them then yeah. it's, it's good to me so um, it looks like you're considering either the left side or the right side screen or these are things nope this, this is together. this is one of the same okay. so if, if I'm a student and I have 5a lunch mm -hmm. um, so I go to lunch and then I have resource <coughs> and then I go to my six hour class um, whereas another student may be in class at that same time in a fifth hour class and then eat 6a or 6b lunch it sort of deviates at that point everybody does the same and you either go to the left or the right side you <coughs> either have class lunch or lunch class and then they all have the same schedule at the bottom so the yeah. blues are essentially your four lunch periods that we would have opposite of class. So, okay. So, but we're still running three lunch periods and time Four slots. lunch periods. <coughs> We'd have four lunch periods. Okay. I think I see it. 5A, 5B, 6A, five, uh, and 6B are all lunch periods. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah, but it doesn't time-wise. Yeah. Gotcha. Time it does, yeah. Thank you for and we have the space in the cafeteria? We will. So by, by doing this, we would actually shrink the lunch sizes down to about 210, or whatever our, our yeah. grade level size is roughly. Um, and based upon the architectural drawings we have, cafeteria is still plenty big enough. The, the new resource space would be big enough as well. Um, add in combination if we had the gym open, let's say, for uh, a recess period for some students, then that would alleviate some of the the space as well. So with the extra time, does this give the kids an extra day off? Does not give them an extra day off? No. It's a fair it's a question. Minutes faster. So, <laughs> I mean, our, our calendar that has been approved already, um, those are our school days. Uh, ultimately, it's, it's based upon minutes, not days right. for students. So we, we could add 15 days if we wanted to 
but if we didn't well, yeah, have the you're minutes. Getting, you're gaining six minutes, though, here, right? Well, but they're losing we are, um, but we, we could also add days or subtract days if we had the right minutes. It's a, it's a combination of things. Okay. I, I, I'm in favor that based upon our achievement scores and things like that, we need as much time as we can get with our students. But to answer your question, we did buffer the instructional minutes a little bit if we ever wanted to, based on last year's weather. <laughs> However, I'm a little reluctant to sort of jump into that world quite yet. On the high end. Yeah, so we added more instructional minutes that we have a buffer for for inclement weather right now. So this does add, that was not the goal, it just happened to be that. But I, <clears> but I don't know that it equates into complete days or anything that we want to do. It just buffers it a little bit more. And, and it offers up that flexibility. So last year, I mean, we were able to participate in our payday event. Um, it was nice that we didn't have to have the entire school here on that day. We had some field trips, some other things going on at that time. Um, but if, if our students are, if only our juniors are here on a, on a single day, for example, going through payday, we can't count those instructional minutes for the other students. So uh, you're adding six minutes to the day, but you're carving out 25 minutes in the middle of it that wasn't there before. So it's a net loss of 19 minutes per day, which is huge. How do we how do we do that, unless we were way fat on an instructional minutes per day to begin with? So we 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 shrink the actual class period by a minute, um, or by two minutes, I should say, 48 minutes. Yeah, two minutes. Um, so yes, it it is a a loss of classroom instructional time. However, our Falcon time was an ad that we had that we've seen as a significant value add for our students in that instructional time uh, to get those, those additional minutes of support, whereas prior they had zero hour, which wasn't as effective for those students. So over the course of the past couple of years, yes, there's still a net gain. So do you consider Falcon time instructional minutes? Absolutely. Do you consider the resource time instructional minutes? Uh, still to be decided on, on what the purpose is with that time. I, th I think students can use it as instructional time. Um, one of the models and conversations we've had is offering up some you know, writing lab support where a student who, for example, maybe not have a study hall and may have a falcon time that they need to go see some other staff members for extra help can actually come to a writing lab or a, a language lab or something like that to get support. So yes, it's instructional, but it's not maybe as guided as some of our other instructional time. So if this wasn't considered instructional time, would we still have enough instructional minutes? Yes. So did we not reduce the uh, number of minutes for passing time before, before because of uh, the number of instructional minutes? No, we reduced passing time to uh, gain our Falcon time. Okay. So is this not, this essentially, I mean, you don't really know how you want to use it, but it sounds like you may end up using it like another Falcon time. And if we're, what we're trying to do is um, give kids a break, so to speak, mm -hmm. and also have it work out with this bell schedule and, uh, and you know fit that many kids into that period of time for lunch in a given size of cafeteria and all that. Uh, my concern is you, you don't really know how you want to use that time yet, but you're we, looking we, to we get do know. that. We do know how we want to use the time. I, what we're saying is we still have some parameters that we want to place around this. Um, we recognize that there are some students, if told, would go see, see teachers every day for extra help during that time. If the goal for us is to offer time for students to have a bit of that brain break and relaxation, as well for teachers to have that time to be able to collaborate and connect with their colleagues, use the bathroom, make photocopies, as you heard from our, our two teachers that presented, we need to have some parameters around there that says, yes, this is instructional time, time for you to get extra help and support but from these individuals only who are in the writing lab or these individuals only who are supporting whatever the case may be. So those are the parameters that I'm speaking to. Um, what this does is it meets our goals of providing that time that students and staff have asked for, for a bit of that break, relaxation, decompressed time, study hall time for those that need study hall, mm -hmm so that they can use Falcon time as that time to actually go get the extra help and support that they need. Well, that Falcon time, I'm talking about the resource time. Mm -hmm. Yep, so the resource so, becomes their study hall time. Okay, because I'm just concerned that without defined parameters, you're gonna, well, we've got this 25 minutes and we need to present this program, so we're gonna have mm -hmm. all the kids, you know, during this resource time today, you know, forgo their downtime and, and deal with 
whatever program like the student council wants to present or that the administration wants to present or something like that. It seems like carving out more time of their yeah. day that instead of ending up being resource time mm -hmm. ends up being time for administration or certain groups to speak for the student's time. And, and, that, and that's why about that happen. That's why Falcon time is the best use for that time because I'm guaranteed that if I need to see all my juniors, every single junior is available during that Falcon time. Not every junior is available necessarily during this resource time. So it, it behooves us to maintain that within our structure of Falcon time, that our Mondays are those times that we're presenting the information from <coughs> administration or guidance to students. It's all hands on deck at that point. Middle of the day, really, that's, that's time that teachers and staff and students have asked for. My last concern is the freshman academy. It seems as though uh, this kind of, it does it disband the freshman academy or just, or just no, not it, keep it, them? It provides flexibility where we could schedule out freshman academy periods one, two, three. We could schedule out freshman academy periods two, three, four, three, four, five. So it doesn't abandon freshman academy. It just, Correct. It just uh, disperses the students from their own lunch period. Correct. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Appreciate the info. Mm -hmm. So would this ever be something where you see teachers establishing like office hours or something once a week or something like that to be available? Or is this complete downtime? But potentially. Um, what One of the pieces that we would have to establish is supervision for these spaces. Um, and so we would be asking our staff to be those supervisors. Uh, so depending on how we set that up, Staff could have, you know, office hours or, what, or whatnot, if you will, in a resource space where they are available to connect and work with students um, in a study hall type environment. But we, we want to make sure we maintain um, where students are as well. Um, we don't want them wandering throughout the building and mm -hmm. saying, well, I've got to go see Mr. Boots for uh, office hours. And are you actually there or are you teaching class? It, it, it becomes the logistics that we want to. Okay hold it a little tighter to begin with. Yeah. Because they can do that during Falcon time right Correct. now, right? Okay. Correct. Do you have anything else for the presentation? Is this it? Uh, this is it. It's just <coughs> a recap of any conversations <coughs> we've had and questions. Chris, I know. I just, we got to get through this first, and then I can go on here. I, I think it's, uh, it's nice to see, considering we're talking about trying to encourage kids to take classes or take classes they want to take, mm -hmm. or the ones that are afraid to take a study hall. Now you have the opportunity for a little more time to mm -hmm. decompress or work with someone, whereas ordinarily in our prior schedules, it was either you had one or you didn't. Right. You had no time or you had some time. So I do think it opens up a lot of flexibility, yep. so I do like that. Time is the number one piece that everyone seems to ask mm -hmm. for more of. We, we can't make more time on the clock, but mm -hmm. we can carve out our time differently. And this, this seems to help solve some of those issues of time. Well, I, I like it uh, from the provided that parameters are laid out that mm -hmm. not everybody who has a voice can start speaking for a kid's mm -hmm. time, you know, mm -hmm. in, you know, for the next three resource periods, I need this or that from all these, you know, if it's, if it's carved out for the kids and you think they can use it and they'll be allowed to use it as opposed to people seeing an opportunity to consume their time and it'll defeat the purpose, then it sounds like a good idea, but you have to protect it. Absolutely. And, I, and the, the reason that we still have a little more work around the parameters is that the students are the ones who need to be there at the table on those parameters. If it's their time, they need to be the ones with the voice to say, here's how we see this best used. But they have limited voice, especially you know, there's probably kids, like I don't know who is on your, uh, with, with your group of kids mm -hmm. that were involved with this, you know, but a lot of times <coughs> it can be the same focus group of kids involved in student council and this mm -hmm. and that. Meanwhile, the majority of the student body, body isn't consulted on uh, anything because they tend not to be the ones to step up and say, yep. hey, I want to get involved with this or with that. So you get a limited viewpoint mm -hmm. uh, from a, a focus group of kids that are all kind of similar and involved in stuff. So my concern isn't this one small group of kids, how they draw parameters for, you know, I'm concerned that the administration establishes a protection for this time mm -hmm. 
so it can be a resource time for the ones that need it, but uh, the, the downtime, in-school homework time, whatever the individual kid needs. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the group, you, you saw a group that came to present, um, that was one of the groups, also met with uh, a classroom um, of students, uh, one of Mr. Smith's classrooms, he, he gave me for a couple days to present and discuss and have debates and look at different models. What and grade was that? I'm sorry? What grade or grade? Mixed grade? grades. So sophomore through senior were in okay. that grade. <coughs> Thanks. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I'm interested in, if it would work logistically, is allowing kids to go to the library. I know you mentioned the gym, but I would like to know or suggest that the library is also on the table for kids. Mm -hmm. I know we all support literacy, and so having that as a resource um, might also be a good option for, re, um, for this mm -hmm. uh, resource time that kids might enjoy and might, you know, that pleasure reading and, mm -hmm. and the opportunity to connect with books. Yep. Definitely, it, some of it has to do with staffing when mm -hmm. we have the library open with staff. Mm -hmm. um, uh, our, our Joey Sabar, our district librarian, and I have had conversations about possibly having some satellite library space down in the new um, resource area where there's maybe a bookshelf with some books for students to you know, do a self-checkout with. So we were investigating some different options. We had talked in the past about maybe getting volunteers to staff the library. Um, I don't really have the ability to collect a group of volunteers, but you, you know, names, but you did sound like that was possible if parents wanted to volunteer to staff the library or something like that. Maybe that's something we could get going so that the actual library could be used as mm -hmm. a library like, yeah, all day. From a sense of having quiet space, there's something nice about that. Mm -hmm. yep. You know, I'm not sure how busy. You know, everybody's different in mm -hmm. what uh, they like and need in terms of mm -hmm. their space. Yep, very much so. Okay, anybody else? Thanks very much, Charlie. Yep. Thanks, yeah. Chris. If you just come up, if you can come up here, we gotta get your name and address and all that good stuff. Oh, you're good. Thank you. Yeah? You can sit next to me. Okay. <laughs> Hi, Charlie. Hi. <laughs> My name is Chris Rupin. I live at 4027 South 119th Street in Greenfield, 53228. Um, my comment about this, I think it's all fine and great. Um, I'm curious, are we going in the wrong direction when it comes to start times? Aren't our high schoolers supposed to start later? Why don't we change it for five minutes later? I know you're going to come up with the bus stuff. But I'd, I'd almost rather see the middle schoolers start. I don't know. I'd rather see stuff. I kind of feel like, and, and globally speaking, five minutes is not a thing, but I kind of feel like, ooh, we don't want to keep on shifting to the left, right? Because then we're back in the quandary of my first class is at 710. And that's way past when my kids would be here, but I'm just thinking, like, why can't we go further? That's my, that's my big comment. I'm sure I'm under three minutes. Thank you for listening. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Point. Do you want me to respond at all? <laughs> I, I mean, we, we have one of the later start times of our conference. Um, I, I agree. It, first hour, you see some, some students that maybe aren't fully awake yet. It's not uncommon. Um, yeah, the, the busing is definitely a concern. I know Steph's Corner is upset with us if we were. We should bring our imagination destination <laughs> folks back. Yeah. This is what is called a conundrum, great. I think the little girl called. So this is truly the conundrum because research will tell you that without a doubt. Oh, yeah. um, unfortunately, things like logistics get in the way. I don't want to use the athletics coach or the work the kids go to jobs after school, all of that stuff. That's the reality. And if we changed our start time and couldn't end until, let's say, 4 o'clock and no other school in our conference did that, our students would be missing like three hours of classes to get to athletics, which, so I, I actually hate to actually say those things that get in the way of doing that, but that is the reality. There is one conference that I'm aware of in the state of Wisconsin, and all high schools in that conference, it's in the Madison area, decided to change to a later start time. But they all had to do it in order for all of the events that they all compete in, in order to, and it's not just athletics, it's Model UN or any DECA, anything that they all compete in. So I really don't like this, 
but that, that's part of the reality. The other part of it is with um, high school students having jobs after school or being sometimes the um, care providers for their younger siblings and making sure that they're home prior to the elementary students. So those are some, yeah, okay, see? <laughs> yeah. so, <laughs> so we get the logistics without a doubt. Like I, I yes, yes. So how is it working in Madison? That um, might, it's, be, that might be something to look at. It is, but w that means we would have to, like all of our athletic conference would have to take that. We've talked about it as school districts. I think it's the age, of, for those of us who have been in this world for so long, it's the constant question that we ask ourselves. Sure. How do we do that? Because we don't control, <coughs> we talk about start time for athletics. We can't start school until after September 1, but athletics are starting the end of July. We can't, we, you know, we can't control that piece of it too. So. It's a conversation if people are, are wanting to take it on, all 16 schools in our conference would sort of have to put that alignment into it. How many schools are in the Madison conference? I think there were seven or eight in that specific conference. We have this Woodland yeah, East, East South West, thing, yeah. yeah. So I'm just asking sure. how it's working there because somebody in the state is trying it as a conference. So. Yeah, I don't know, I mean, I haven't talked to any of those districts specifically, but they collectively got together to make it happen. Okay, thank you. And again, towards this point, at least on the upside with the schedule, we are minimizing that zero hour, which was seven o'clock mm -hmm. starts. Right. Which, yeah. We're much better yeah. than we were in the past without right. a doubt. So that is at least a 45 minute savings. We just earned ourselves kind of. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And the buses, we struggle. Get, I mean, if we, in a situation where there were different buses, I don't know what their busing situation is in Madison, but we have to reuse our buses. And so it's not a matter of getting a whole different set of buses to be able to even mitigate some of that but yeah yes we were very conscious of that it was hard for us to look at five minutes but all right thank you thanks Trump thank you. on to B Whitnell middle school grading Um, just here this evening just to um, provide some background. Well, you, you were here last year. So um, last year about this time, um, December, January, the high school shifted um, from the, the scale they were using to a little bit more of a A, B, C, D scale. And so as we continued to talk at that time, uh, the timing wasn't right, at least in my conversations with uh, Lynn and, and Dr. Olson and some others. And so um, as we continue to try to align or kind of create some consistency between our schools, both going from middle school to high school and from elementary school to uh, the middle school. Uh, one thing that has probably come up the most for me is in some of my feedback from parents at PTO or in other conversations, just this is about our grade scale and the consistency that they, people would like to see as it would transition up and through. So I'm here tonight just to make the proposal or make the request or state, sure. share <laughs> that uh, all of those maybe, I don't know, all, that um, we would like to adjust our grade scale to align closer to the high schools um, in, our, in our grades six, seven, and eight to create some consistency and clarity as we move forward. Uh, we aren't changing any of the practices or any of the reporting that we go through, it's just on the way it looks on a report card or on the way it would look on the side of the rubric um, for clarity purposes and some cohesiveness moving up. So for kids that were, if we, if we change it next year and the kids that are right in the middle of it all, how would that affect them if they are going from a e, one through four to yeah the E's and the P's? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I think a lot of our I shouldn't say a lot. I should say this is many of the people that I speak to kind of do that correlation anyways and try and correlate the E to what that actually equals or doesn't. Um, even though when we're trying to talk about proficiency or standardized grading, that doesn't always match up to an A or a B or an E. Um, I think I think the transition would be fine. I've I've been in other parts where we've made this shift. Um, going either way and t tending to usually come back to this side. I think it would be clearer for our parent groups um, and I think it wouldn't be much of a transition for our students. And you, would you foresee or wonder if parents would challenge um, if you said they had, you know, when you convert it, that maybe they were thinking they were going to get a higher grade? Um, we, I guess, just no, yeah, like, sure. they should get, they have a B, now I think they should have an A. I think we have some parents that, 
like when they advocate for their kids do that from you know they get a p they, they want the e or vice versa or trying to understand it um i mean we still are I, I believe at least in a spot where many of us have gone through grading systems and scales that use those corresponding components to kind of create clarity for us um and so i don't i don't think we'd have any more challenging than we would because we're not averaging grades we're still looking at growth over time and trying to make those judgments as teachers and educators How long been, sorry, go ahead. no i was just bob just to confirm though you guys don't calculate gpa don't. and you don't do an honor roll or anything like that so you're not having any residual and transition nothing, issues nothing tabulates so there's not like a percentages or anything okay. even behind so. well that's a question is would we give kids an annual GPA or would we start an honor roll at the middle school because um, I think those things are on the table if we have if, if we're using they're on the table anyway because we have a it translates to a five-point grading system so are we talking about that no yeah. doing no, we're not. At, we're not advocating yeah. to adding a GPA or an honor roll at the middle school. Okay, can you explain that for why? This or why district not? has never had that, and Lynn is. Not, she's ill tonight. Otherwise, she was going to be co-presenting with um, Bob. But they have never had that piece of it. Part of because of what that emphasizes at that point, and so this part of it is to just translate to the rubrics that yep. the high school is using, but not advocating adding an honor roll or a GPA at the middle school. And just to confirm, we have both of those things at the high school. Do we have honor roll? I know we have GPA. We don't have an honor roll. We have the, as we talked about at the graduation status, about your cumulative GPA and what that is, as far as what that looks like. But we don't have a quarterly or semester-wide recognition of honor roll, no. We used to recognize, um, just as recently as two or three years ago, we recognized um, kids that uh, students that that achieved a three five or higher for and I don't know why we cool. ever went away from that but um, that's for graduate no no we used to do a thing every year yes in the correct cafeteria. that part is true we're we not to, yeah high honors that exists we used to do a thing every for just because we're talking here we used yeah. to do a thing every year in the cafeteria where the counselors would print out certificates uh, mm -hmm. for the uh, students that did three five or better. And they would, uh, you know, the, the, it was in the late in the second semester, and they would. Uh, it was there was a, a, a freshman day, a sophomore day, and a junior day, uh, to where they they come in for that, and then uh, the senior uh, day was uh, they did the thing in the auditorium uh, on stage in, in prime time, you know, in the evening or something, and then one year there were no certificates, and the next year the thing was just gone. So we used to recognize that we don't anymore. For what level of kids? What age group? What grade? For ninth through eleventh. Okay. So the breakfast just translated to the all school. So that is still happening, but we don't do what you would call some districts have a semester honor roll that they publish and give to the paper or whatever. But we still do the annual recognition of freshmen, sophomore, junior, seniors at the all school assembly. Back back to the middle school. Uh, are you talking about plus minus grading <coughs> uh, or just straight A B C D F? That's the first question I got on the list. <laughs> um, we have, I, don't, I guess I wouldn't say that we've had that official discussion yet. Okay. We're just making that. Um, we wanted to include our staff a little bit more with that discussion as far as that goes. Great answer. Uh, and then how long were you using the EPDBN? Um, at least since I've been here. Um, so I, be I believe it's been like three or four years. I'm not sure about the middle school. Yeah, the elementary school has had it for, for a while. I want to... Uh, for some reason, I want to say Lynn had told me it was four or five years ago. Yeah, I would say four, three to four years is the middle school, elementary has been. I, uh, I, I like, first, I like the change. Which way? The change, not how they're doing it now, but what they're proposing to do. Okay. The other thing. They, they were at ADC. Five years ago. Yeah, I think so. I think it was. F I, I remember Lynn saying yeah. four or five. Four, yeah. As 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 we start to align some of our coursework with the high school and the two examples, yep. of, in addition to the core classes, but I think of like world languages or like digital communications, as some of our classes start to equate to like what they could be as a freshman level, I think it would help out kids seeing their pathways a little bit clearer and help parents help make decisions as they move up too. So. Bob. 
part of the, I think part of the conversation that also came up is when we were meeting with the athletic co-curricular yep. handbook, and that became really challenging for parents to, to look at what's an E or B or whatever. So that it really sort of brought That's this to light about the, the alignment and our teachers not really being able to communicate would, that in terms of that co-curricular <laughs> this year. That and it would, make that, that would make that co-curricular handbook consistent, uh, minus like a numbers change as far as like the number of days for middle school versus high school because our seasons aren't as long. Chris? Oh, back up. Uh, you have down here Bell and grades, unless you don't oh. want to talk about grades. Yeah, no, um, just, um, come, yeah, come back up here again so we can get it on recording. Oh, Thank you. Come and sit next to me. No, you're fine. Oh, okay. I'll stay with you. Thanks. I just wanted to say that I was in favor of the, the grading change, and I was you know, I was never, so I think to answer the question about when do we change, I think we've had that letter grade for four years, because I think when when my kid came over in sixth grade, the first year was like one, two, three, four, maybe, does that sound right? Sounds right and then, so when he was in seventh, and he's in 10th now, so I think four years we had those letter grades. And I truly did not care that much, I mean, I was not all in a, all in a tizzy about the changes to the E, P, whatever, whatever they all are. I mean, it's just a range. The only time that I had a problem with it was when my kid was applying to the, um, and there was an engineering camp at Madison. And my kid's a good student, but at that time you really couldn't get E's. So I feel like everybody is lumped into a P. And so it didn't really show that he was excelling or outstanding. He didn't get chosen, and then the whole program just fell apart. So it makes no difference, but that's the only thing I felt like the um, the non ABCD whatever did not help you match with other kids in other districts. That's what I had to say. Um, and I think I might have a cohort back there who um, is interest is wondering if this grading system would be sort of like updated, like the high school is to see like a running grade in the class if we get to that point. Does that make sense? So I think. I think in high school, when the when assignments or tests comes in, it like auto kind of calculates the the grade of the child in the class. So your grades go up and down. I don't know if that would be the case in Infinite our, our, Campus for a middle not, school. Ours does not calculate like that. But I mean, like if we change to this thing, if that would be something that would happen. Yes. <laughs> um, I think that. It's a different discussion. Okay, um, to be determined. But I cool. think what we try to look at is kids' growth over time. And so sometimes when you do the calculating, it's harder to do that, and you then still end up making the judgments. So uh, when we do formative assessments, if a kid is getting a, a C or a C, and then they, they ace on the final, the way my staff, and at least the way that we've been working, would say that you would have earned that A then, because you've mastered it over time, so you've proven it. Um, but I, I don't believe we're at a spot where we're going to be calculating grades. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, you have to sign in at the beginning. It, oh. Should we make it? You can make the call. Everybody okay with us? I'm good with it. Allowing them to speak. Sure. Okay. Yeah. We'll just need your information at the end. But normally this is on the back there if you just sign in before. So if you can have a seat, uh, state your name and your address. Aaron Jackson, one one two four three West Talon Circle, Greenfield five three two two eight. Um, first, I, I just want to go on record saying I support Mr. Antheline on uh, this decision to uh, investigate and change these grading scales. Um, from a parent perspective, it is very difficult to see a student come home with a assignment and you can easily calculate that the student got 90% correct on it and see a P on the, on the, the paper and then uh, a different assignment comes home and the student maybe gets 40 or 60 percent on it and still has the P on the assignment and you have no way or means as a parent to truly assess how he's performing. Um, so I think you know something consistent with how I went to school here in the district um, 
A, B's, C's, D's, F's is more easily understood by parents and um, represents true performance. The other thing I just would like to correct is uh, the middle school did and have GPAs and uh, honor roll historically. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. On to C, 2020 WASB resolutions. What do you got, Clint? Well, I just wanted to uh, make aware that Kevin will be going yep. to the uh, area to the convention and you vote on these resolutions Correct. to either have our advocacy group push them or not, right? Correct. Uh, and if so you had one that you wanted to speak on or you wanted something said or you had a specific voice either way, bring it forward. I also want to say thanks for sending the email because you're the one that's usually on top of reminding everybody about it. So it's in your board packet. Um, if something comes up, we don't vote till next Wednesday is when the delegate assembly is. If you feel strongly about something, send me an email. Um, let me know what you think. There are, get the exact number. there are 17 resolutions and more or less what it is is uh, all the school districts have one representative and everybody votes whether or not we support the resolution or not. And then WASB takes it forward and works with their um, different legislative groups and lobbies for those causes or those forms of aid or those changes or what it may be. So how would you vote on a item which there are in there that don't really pertain to us, like uh, <coughs> busing for the busing situation for uh, outlying areas? There's a few. Um, I try to put a little effort in to see how in any way it would affect us. Um, Cause there's different things when it comes to aid that that could take away from us. Like when you talk about more negatively funded as a district, um, there's been a number of other districts where it specifically impacts us if we support something and it would take money away from us. Um, that's how I try to look at it. There's some that are not necessarily resolutions, more or less just a support that really isn't due with us. Like, uh, I'm trying to think. There was one in here. Um, most of, some of these ones I do vote in favor for, but a lot of times I sit and listen because sometimes there's some, the people that bring this forward will come up and elaborate on it a lot further. Um, but I try to specifically the ones that talk about aid, try to look at how it would actually affect us before I go in there and vote for something. Because um, I think we were one of the few, because how many, Mike, how many negatively funded districts roughly are there? I mean, it's, it's, it's half. It's I mean, half, that's how yeah. it kind of just breaks yeah, down about the half, averages. Yeah, you said so. Um, some are more vocal than others last time because there was a resolution out there, I forget exactly what it was, and pretty much said, if we do this, I lose funding, I don't have that much money to begin with, but. So I'm about the English learner one right now, is that what you're? Um, that's one of them that doesn't necessarily, although I think we do have a few for a number of ESL students. Yeah, English as a second one, is that how it is? Yeah, yeah. ESL students. Mm -hmm. um, and how would you vote for unfunded mandates? Which one are we on? I'm sorry, there's 17. There's a couple there. Well, the, the school report card. You mean, you mean just those ones? School some of the ones I, right. I personally on some of these things, and there's a lot of people that will send up there where we're voting on something that's not actually something. It's just saying we support right. this. Or there are some directly. That. And there, there's a lot, there are ones Related to leg <coughs> legislation. Correct, there some but there are, are. there are also some that um, was like trying to tell us that we should do something as if to imply that we weren't already doing it. And that I'm not for, like, or telling us that each of our, or I forget what it was, where it more or less takes the power out of our hands to determine what we want to say. Or saying like, we don't want drugs in school. We don't need a resolution to say we don't want drugs in school. Nobody wants drugs in school, and now we're spending all this time. We're going to pay our WASB to go up there and go tell legislators something they already know. I'm curious to see on a couple of these how some of the schools that like one of them is the Native American mascot one, and I'm curious to see what a lot of those schools actually have to say or what they'll come forward with, especially ones that are maybe not as blatant as other ones are. Well, they talk about all the costs that could be associated with it. And mm -hmm. Manali Falls just went through it. And, and that's gonna take that, that too. With that, it talks about providing that resolution, talks about providing funding from the state for them to make that transition. And then it's a matter of how much funding and 
what it all entails and specifics, and a lot of it doesn't get into that specifics. I'm also curious on that of how much money are we talking here to have other school districts or for us to pay for other school districts to do something maybe they either should have done before or maybe it, they don't need to do or how do they want to go about it. Good. Thank okay. you. Then you report back to us? Yeah. Great. Great. All right. Thank you. On to seven items of future consideration. Okay, on to eight announcements. Um, you should have all gotten uh, an invitation to the uh, Greenfield Park and Rec Recognition Dinner on uh, the 31st. To our house? Should have been mailed to us. Uh, did we get them here? Yeah, they were here. They were here at your place. At the yeah, a couple of weeks ago, I think. Uh, yeah, I remember. Um, <laughs> So I, I don't think there were any witness. There, there is, is. one of our students got coach of the year. Actually, oh. is one of our seniors, Brandon. So okay. See, yeah. Perfect. So we we were looking too, and all of a sudden, I'm like, wait, that's one of our students who actually got park and rec coach of the year on there. So. So I didn't recognize the name. So mm -hmm. very good. And yeah. uh, so it is uh, Friday night. It's the 31st, and so our SVPs are due pretty soon. Um, and. Um, since I'm on the board, typically they have this on a night that I can't attend, but this year I can attend. So um, I will be attending, so I hope Sweet. some of you else will be attending as well. Okay. No. Any other? Where is it at? It's at the community center. Uh, Falcon Fest. <coughs> what date is that again? February 29th. February 29th. February 29th. There's more information. Reach out to the Booster Club. Check their website for more information. Um, anybody else have announcements? Yeah, so we do have that show, 100 Years of Broadway, um, Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night at 7 <coughs> p.m., and Sunday at 2 p.m. here in the Whitnall High School Auditorium. And the Whitnall Middle School has a Chipotle Eat and Earn tomorrow night. So if you're hungry, go to Chipotle. You don't have to be a Whitnall Middle School person. You just show up and... Uh, Tell them you're with Whitnall. There's, I think there's a, like a little flyer you can put on your phone. Um, but they're, they've been very good to work with, and uh, you can come support the middle school. Uh, anybody else? Yeah. Uh, I saw wrestling, swimming, and boys basketball last week. Yeah. It was a tough loss in a couple. Uh, swimming was a little tough. Swimming against someone who's probably going to the Olympic trials. That was a little really? hard to go. They broke, they, uh, the kid from Greenfield broke multiple pool records in the one night. Is it kid at Greenfield that is? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. What, he's, what? I think he's broken six of their pool records already. And, uh, and yeah. what does he do? Uh, he's he a fast. freestyler and he's a flyer. But yeah, he swims fast. But he swam, a, he, he swam a stroke that he doesn't ever swim at their pool. And Sorry. he would have placed at state at that yeah, event with that time. So it was tough. For uh, Tokyo? That'd be for Tokyo that he'd be going for. Wow. Tokyo. So uh, wrestling put a... Put a nice hurt on Greenfield, at Greenfield, so that was fun to watch. It was over really quick. Man, Lots of wins. I will. I mean, they kind of got back at us at basketball. <laughs> and one basketball event, I think we uh, handled ourselves wow. elsewhere, but we'll get them next time. But lots of sporting events, lots of things happening, so get out there, see stuff. It's fun. Whitnall is hosting a middle school conference wrestling tournament uh, this coming Saturday and then next week Saturday is the high school Zelinsky Memorial Tournament so anybody want to come out and support the wrestling program it's a great way to do it oh, I think uh, I've got one more what you're, yeah oh, go ahead. so um, Whittle Middle School is going to be having a career day coming up and it's in the planning stages now so one of the things they're looking for is professionals to come in and talk about their occupations with some of the middle schoolers so like I said, it's in the planning stages, but that's something you could reach out to Mr. Antheline about. And um, great job to the music program last week for the jazz band performances, the dual performance between the middle school and the high school. Uh, that night it was a great, uh, great performance and a lot of fun for the kids. Anybody else announcements? Okay, then I'll take a motion to adjourn a closed session pursuant to Wisconsin Statute 19.851C to discuss a administrator and superintendent mid-year feedback. So moved. Second. second. All right, moved and second. Uh, roll call vote, Nancy. Aye. Quinn. Aye. Stephen. Aye. 
Jonathan. Aye. Kevin. Aye. John. Aye. Karen. Aye. All right, thank you. Have a good evening. Yes. Good